want to uh, formally and officially kick off and welcome you to our uh, first panelist uh, session of the Frameless Labs 2020 Symposium. Uh, and this block is uh, titled Location-Based Stories in XR. Um, I am Peter Murphy. Uh, I am a teacher in the School of Film and Animation. I'll be moderating this session. Um, we're going to have three 20-minute presentations, which will be 15 minutes of uh, a talk and then about five minutes left over for uh, questions. And for people attending, uh, you can type questions into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your webinar frame. Um, and I've heard people screaming. And um, when the presentations are over uh, and we move on to the, to the next presentation, you can still ask questions and the uh, panelists can still answer you in the Q&A box. Um, at, <laughs> excuse me, at the very end of our program, roughly at about 11.30, um, we're going to uh, provide links in the chat for you to go to our hub rooms. So we have three hub rooms designed by our RIT students. Um, and you're gonna be able to enter using either your laptop or if you've got a VR headset, you can use that. And you can choose an avatar and you can navigate around and interact with both our guests and each other and ask questions in there um, and do some other cool stuff. <laughs> These Rooms are a little bit limited, so if you can't get in, in terms of space, if you can't get in right away, um, you can try an alternate room, um, or you can hang out in the waiting room and still watch and hear everything that's going on and enter when somebody else leaves. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first uh, guest, um, uh, uh, also Brooke, Dr. Diane Durr, uh, and Sadia Mir are gonna be presenting uh, Amberto, I'm sorry, Am Am Amberto, uh, Immersive Storytelling Through Augmented Reality. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all to our <laughs> symposium. Okay, thank you so much. Amberto is an augmented reality app that is currently uh, being developed as a core component to the project configuring Comos narrative event place and memory, which began in the summer of 2019. Oops. Okay. Uh, to provide some background and some context, configuring Comos explores the tangible construction of narrative generated from the intangibility of an historic event, the massacre of the a key division in 1943 on the island of Catalonia, Greece. In 1940 and 1941, German and Italian armed forces <laughs> commenced occupation of the island. Following the Italian surrender of, to allied forces, approximately 5,200 Italian soldiers were massacred by German troops during a one week period. This massacre is credited as one of the largest ever prisoner of war massacres in recent history. This research project seeks to investigate narrative threads of the key massacre in the requisite personal stories and event artifacts. Through the triangulation of mediated narrative formation, this project seeks to investigate subjectivity versus objectivity, linearity versus nonlinearity, and the tangible versus intangible in event-oriented ontology. Initial research includes archival material, including artifacts, photographs, and related historical texts, in-person interviews and testimonials, and geolocation and visual documentation of sites. The material generated through this research will serve as, a, as digital content for an augmented reality app, a site-specific multimedia installation, and a catalog of artifacts. In particular, the augmented reality app Ambido will allow users to participate in a site-specific multi-sensory experience across the island. Beginning in October 2019, interviews were conducted with community members of the Greek and Italian communities based in Kefalonia. Interviewees were both witnesses of the massacre with direct childhood experience and memory of the events that took place or descendants of those involved who, had, who hold familiar and uh, collective memory passed down through generations. Very little has been documented a grandson of a fallen soldier expressed, for 20 years, more or less, my mother didn't know what happened, happened to her father 
because officially he was presumed missing in action, presumed dead, but there were no official statement. Even though her mother tried to go to the official army entities, they didn't know, they didn't want to talk about it. Everything was shrouded in mystery because it was shameful for everybody. One purpose of this project is to use augmented reality as a means to gather personal stories that are at risk of remaining hidden or lost and to offer a way to preserve and share such stories that are vital to a community's history. Artifacts of the massacre have been collected by local organizations and are currently exhibited in a small Italian division of key war museum in the town of Ardistoli. Ranging from medals, photographs, newspaper clippings, clothing and military paraphernalia, the museum holds hundreds of objects. Additional ar artifacts in the form of various personal effects have been uncovered by the project collaborators through individual and group interviews. These artifacts, including objects such as jewelry, photographs, and clothing, begin to allude to a meta-narrative stemming from the tragic events. By cataloging these artifacts, we begin to unpack nuanced and entangled narrative threads that cross and tie national alliance and allegiance, community survival, and intergenerational divides. Massacre sites across the island are known within the Kefalonian community and are loosely documented in a leaflet produced by the Divisione Aki Museum. These sites of massacre exist on the island with no recognizable markers or physical indicators. They appear as banal fields, groves of olive trees, abandoned wells, ravines, and town squares. For example, Outside of the village of Faraklata lies a massacre site of roughly 300 individuals, including doctors, nurses, and wounded soldiers at a field hospital. With no usable roads, a 45 minute walk through fields and brush leads to the unmarked site. The absence of documentation for this complex event is substantial. There are no commemoration markers of massacre sites no available documented interviews, and no markers of the mass grave sites. However, the event is deeply embedded in the island's identity. In collaboration with the Ionian Center for Arts and Culture, this project aims to utilize augmented reality as a means to create an immersive site-specific living museum across the island. The island of Kefalonia, located in Western Greece, has a diverse landscape spanning mountainous rocky terrain, fertile farmland, widening roadways, underground waterways, and pristine coastal beaches. This topography presents unique challenges and opportunities in developing and configuring an augmented reality app in order to create the necessary immersive experience within the uni unique conditions of the island. Given the nature of the massacres and the number of sites relevant to them, it would be beyond the scope of this project application to attempt to include every known site for the massacre. The location of some sites on private land, their distance from the shore, their inaccessibility, and the sheer distance between all of them render it difficult to fully document for this purpose. Consequently, a number, a select number of sites were considered for inclusion in Embido as a proof of concept. Uh, perhaps over time, additional sites can be documented and included in order to further expand the immersive experience of the events. In the end, five sites were designated as representative of the events of the massacre. The information captured and employed in the Augmented Reality app consists of audio recordings of personal narratives coupled with photographic documentation of artifacts found both locally at the sites as well as from the Divisione Aki War Museum collection. The sites included are Aya Barbara, the Church of St. Barbara, the well in Prokopata, the wall in Pulata, Casa Rosa in Farao, and the infirmary in Faraklata. Apart from their historic significance, these particular sites were also chosen because of how frequently they were referenced in the interviews and their comparative nearness to each other on the island. While nothing is distant on the island, getting to the five starts sites by car can take the better part of a day. 
Due to the site specificity of events on the island and their location, augmented reality through Ambito will be employed as a means of mapping and embedding the intangible with the tangible while furthering the visitor's process of exploring and experiencing the actual sites. Reliant on the media's ability to collate, catalog, and archive materials in an accessible manner, the use of augmented reality allows visitors or end users a site-specific engagement with the event. Visitors will experience a nonlinear narrative wherein they control the unfolding of events based upon or driven by the path they choose to pursue across the sites of the island. While some sites are closer together than others, the nature of Kefalonia makes for the unfolding of the experience something the end user must decide upon as they traverse the island. Digital content culled from the various points and artifacts help facilitate a multisensorial engagement for visitors, both of an auditory and visual nature. Narrative overlays capture, sorry, narrative overlays capture first and or secondhand personal accounts that buttress imagery corresponding to artifacts attached to the individual sites. The purpose is to lend an air of immediacy to the presence of the viewer of the event they are connecting to via the app. Their presence on the site is the only way to access the information of the event as all data is coupled to the area via geolocation. Kefalonia becomes its own memorial by the active participation of the visitor in effect, an interactive museum that stands testament to the events of 1943. There are several monuments documenting the events of the Aki massacre. This project is akin to them, but can also be seen as the production of a counter monument, one founded upon narrative accounts with the intent of excavating the rich, nuanced personal histories associated with the experience. In granting access to the past in this way, the aim is to destabilize first impressions, yet gain access to the personal experience of an event driven ontology predicated upon location and artifacts associated with events. The intent is to create an expanded experience, but also one that preserves the locations in their present form without drawing attention to their mundane or forgotten nature. Serving as a counter monument to those martyred, the augmented reality environment provides access to the public in the form of a preserved historic record. Visitors listen to the rich personal stories while viewing the illuminating images and artifacts. They are able to benefit from a sensorial experience of the actual location, feeling the warmth of the sun, the sound of the ocean waves breaking on the island shores, and the smell of local flora. The location-based application of augmented reality allows visitors to, to the indiv individual sites of massacre to access the triangulation, triangulate narrative sorry, in a dynamic, immersive experience. The app, Embido, currently in development, employs geo-referencing as a principal instrument for visitors to access a location-based virtual immersive environment through their personal smartphone. Marker-based detections such as 3D image recognition and tracking allow visitors to detect 2D images within the 3D spaces in order to trigger and access digital content. However, any alteration in the physical environment such as construction can disrupt the image and limit the visitor's access. Geo-referencing reliant on geolocated data mitigates potential issues arising from alterations in the physical landscape while maintaining a dynamic immersive experience. Additionally, the use of georeferencing facilitates the opportunity for wayfinding from site to site. Cradled in the territory of locative media, Ambito bridges story formation and reception in time and place. Positioning and geo-based technologies coupled with the layering of virtual information can traverse time anchored in a specific place. Locative media, originally used to characterize location-aware technologies, can heighten an awareness of the genealogy of a place through layers and impermeable traces of personal experience. Matt Ward and Anne Galloway in 2006 likened the non-disciplinarily defined territory of locative media to Deleuze and Guattari's mapping, stating, the map is open, connectable in all its dimensions and capable of being dismantled. It is reversible and susceptible to constant modification. 
It can be torn, reversed, adapted to montages of every kind, taken in hand by an individual or a group or a social formation. Contrary to a tracing, which always returns to the same, a map has multiple entrances. Bruce Sterling describes the way in which it unearths opportunities in space and place, stating, the combination of mobile devices with positioning technologies is opening up a manifold of different ways in which ge geographical space can be encountered and drawn. It thereby presents a frame through which a wide range of spatial practices that have emerged since Walter Benjamin's urban flaneur may be looked at anew. Or are locative media only a new site for old discussions about the relationship of consciousness to place in other people? In the early days of sea travel, it was only the navigator who held such awareness of his exact position on earth. What would it mean for us to have as accurate an awareness of space as we have of time? In the same way that clocks and watches tell us the exact second, portable GPS devices help us pinpoint our exact location on Earth. The end user experience facilitated by georeferencing can tap into the ontological formation of the event while mitigating navigational issues of the island terrain and creating an individual dynamic experience. If and when the island's landscape is altered by future developments, accessing the digital content will not be affected. Visitors will not be limited by 3D image recognition and may access digital content entering into a site from multiple perspectives and literal paths. If memorials are built to commemorate and monumentalize events of our past, their existence roots us in our landscapes. The tragic events of the Key Division massacre have indelibly etched themselves into the landscape of Kefalonia, but also in the minds of those witnessed the events on the island then and their descendants now. Augmented reality affords us the opportunity to excavate memories and link them to our past in new and intriguing ways as we grapple with notions of place, time, and the events that transpire with life. As a triangulating nexus for those concepts, Ambido attempts to access an event-oriented location at a remove from the memorial and modeling, yet inextricably tied to it. The intent is to craft an experience that helps to activate the landscape with narrative voices while evoking images that link the past with the present, the tangible with the intangible, the personal with the historical. Embedded in the landscape of Kefalonia is the memory of the massacre of 5,200 Italian soldiers. And Bito explores this experience and presents a living museum to their memory. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we have about two minutes left for questions. If anyone has a question, please type it into the Q&A box. Um, for our guests to answer. Um, and if nothing comes up in a moment, I will, uh, I have a question to ask you guys. We'll give people a little moment to type in any, anything. Um, there you go. Can you see that guys? Mm -hmm. I can't, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Would you use to create in? Uh, so we are going, we are looking at using um, Wikitude. Uh, we're going to be trying, we'll be using um, Swift to code with and then using Wikitude as the SDK to help with the, uh, to, the production of the actual app. And the question for anyone who didn't see that was what tools uh, did you use to create Vito? Um, I had a quick question in terms of the history of the island and why there is not any memorials there for this event right now. What was the resistance to that uh, culturally or, or for any other reason? Well, there are. There's, there, well, there, there's a number of issues that sort of led to a lack of uh, monumentalizing or, or sort of physical recognition of what had happened. In in large part, immediately after the war, um, both sides uh, refused to sort of recognize it. There, there wasn't a recognition from the Italian side and there wasn't much from the Greek side. Um, so it sort of it was an immediate sort of response that that happened and never really resolved itself. We've heard some some interesting stories about various artifacts in Italy still being sort of hidden away in certain cabinets and and still this kind of lack of acknowledgement. Yeah, well, that makes your, your 
the project's so valuable. It's really great. Um, oh, thank, you. thank you very much. Um, clapping, virtual claps. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Sorry, we can't hear everybody um, responding. Um, uh, we are now going to move on to our uh, our next set of presenters. Um, so we have uh, Melanie Perone and uh, Vicky Car Karasek, uh, Karasek, I'm sorry, Vicky, um, who are, are going to talk about stitching the fragmented 360 videos for language and culture learning. Um, so take it away, guys. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, so good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to our presentation. Um, my name is Vicki Karasik, and I am currently the N Educational Technology Specialist at Bryn Mawr College. And before that, I was the French and Francophone Studies Librarian at Penn Libraries, where I worked with Melanie, um, who I'll let introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, so my name is Melanie Perron. I'm a French lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania. And this is where uh, I met Vicky and we created this whole project. And so the projects that we'll present to you today were created for an advanced French history and culture course entitled Paris under the German occupation and its places of non-memory. And the course description reads, in this course, we will explore the dark years of the Vichy regime's collaboration with Nazi Germany. Thus, we will be exploring a past that none of us has experienced directly. And not just any past, a past which was repressed, masked, disguised, a past full of shadows, a past only spoken of in whispers, a past recalled by memories with gaping holes. How can one talk about what happened? What words can one use to tell the story of the missing? These are some of the challenges faced by the post-Auschwitz society. This is the challenge of the course. Paris will be our anchor in this course. Paris, capital torturer, capital victim, capital witness. We will listen for the whispers of stories trapped among its, its streets and walls that many wanted to lock away to silence upon the liberation. These are the stories that we will then try to catch, to restore in flesh and voice, to hold on to as we engage in the difficult exercise of remembrance. It goes without saying that the goal will not be to judge, but to try to understand a past, a past that does not pass. I do not hear what she says. Je n'entends pas ce qu'elle dit. The lexical confusion of a student whose mother tongue is Spanish was the seminal moment. Translating entender to understand by the French entendre to hear to explain that she did not understand what the author said in her diary written in 1942 made so much sense. The apparent mistake conjured up a series of fundamental questions. How to understand a story if you do not hear the voice that tells it? How to make sense of words pronounced by voices without context? How to imagine Paris under the German occupation without knowing its space? And more importantly, for this specific course, how can students of French from an American university understand a past neither of us lived and which happened far from their home? In order to address these questions, first an interactive map was created with the support of the Penn Libraries and the Price Lab for the Digital Humanities. The map was designed to help students, some of whom had never been to Paris, envision as best as possible the Paris of the time, but also to become the space where stories of individuals who vanished could recover their voices. The objective of the map was to get students closer to the subject, and we needed to be careful that the feel of the platform did not contribute to further distance on their part. After exploring many tools, we settled on Omeka, the free open source web authoring tool, and the plugin Neatline, which we used to build the map feature. Both Omeka and Neatline required some development and customization by our digital humanities specialists, after which Melanie and her students were able to contribute to the content. The map significance lies in this spatial visual visualization of history, which contributes to reducing the historical and psychological distance that separates us from then and them. For instance, one could tell students that 13,000 Jews, most of whom lived in East Paris, were rounded up on July 16, 1942 and taken to a stadium 
located in West Paris before being sent to concentration camps, it would not trigger the same understanding of history as showing them on the map where the stadium stood. Once they see how close it was to the Eiffel Tower held as a symbol of modernity and culture, they understand how unfathomable the event was at the time and still is. It also enables them to wonder how Parisians could say they did not know when many of them must have witnessed the day-long procession of buses crossing the city from east to west. These were questions post-war France had to face as well. Another key material aiming at addressing the issue of distance, distanciation are the testimonies Francine Christophe, Rachel Gedinac, and Arlette Testiller left with the USC Shoah Foundation Visual History Archive, as well as the autobiographical novel entitled On the Inner Stage, written by Marcel Cohen. The four survivors lived in Paris before and during the war, before being interned, deported, or hidden. These narratives literally help the students hear the past. Following the same method as the historical map, I started geolocating the places mentioned in these testimonies so, in class, students could connect the witnesses' childhood spaces to the historical occupation of the city. Our idea to incorporate 360 videos was based on a combination of factors that emerged as we further developed the digital map and thought about future directions for the project. In 2017, around the time Melanie and I had started collaborating on making the digital map, the Penn Libraries embarked on an initiative called Penn Immersive in concert with Penn's theme year that year, which was the year of innovation. The goal of Penn Immersive was to engage the campus in a public research project to explore the potential of virtual reality, augmented reality, and 3D modeling in teaching research and learning. Many of the courses we had worked with or classes we supported in this initiative often were science or health related, and we didn't have much uptake in humanities classes. However, we were inspired by a cinema and media studies professor and his class who worked with Film Aid International to learn how to take 360 videos at a refugee camp in Kenya using visual storytelling to provide information to hundreds of thousands of people in displaced communities about their rights and their future. It was a very powerful experience for students to work on this project and then come back and share the videos with the community. And we immediately thought that something like this could bring Melanie's students even closer to the course material. This coupled with the fact that in fall 2019, Melanie's course would become a Penn Global seminar culminating in a trip to Paris over winter break 2020 made the prospect of having students engage in a VR project while in Paris even more appealing to us. In order to get more background and research in this area, Megan Moody, uh, who is in this, um, in this call right now, um, who at the time was the teaching and learning librarian at Penn Libraries, attended the Immersive Pedagogies Conference in the summer of 2019 in order to workshop our project ideas with others exploring humanities-based projects, and also to learn about the resources and research involved in undertaking this kind of endeavor. So in July 2019, Rachel Gedinac took me to her childhood neighborhood. And using a 360 camera, Rachel was filmed walking us through the main places of her, of her childhood, in front of her home, her grandparents and her cousins home stood, inside her elementary school, in front of the building she was locked in along with her mother, her sister and hundreds of Jews from her neighborhood before being bused to the stadium near the Eiffel Tower. These videos were then added to the digital map dedicated to Rachel's story. This original experience with virtual reality technology enabled the digital cartographic translation to don a humanity that speaks to us today. It also inspired the following student task-based digital projects we want to share with you. Critical making, which as Matt Ratto says, ultimately involves a personal investment and a caring for when navigating the relationship between technology and society was at the cornerstone for our planning this particular VR project. We were curious about the possibilities of 360 in this context, getting at the question of how to cultivate deeper empathy and understanding of these histories for students. Through 360 videos, students would not only be able to visit these places where they cannot physically go, but also view them from the context of Marcel Cohen's memories, moving as he would have moved, hearing his words with voiceover narration, 
being part of the story, the story themselves and having the freedom to look and to notice. Furthermore, positioning the students as creators of these experience, experiences cause them to ask deeper questions and play a more active role in the history. As these videos will be used as future course material, we not only ask students to interpret Marcel Cohen's words through these recordings, but also to consider the viewer's perspective to produce a compelling and illuminating learning, learning experience. So um, as Vicky said, last fall, the course included an eight day trip to Paris conducted after the end uh, of the semester. The final project for the course consisted in picking a particular place mentioned in On the Inner Stage and filming with a 360 camera, meticulously listening to Marcel Cohen's words. It enabled them to literally be walking in the little boy's steps. Despite the changes the streets underwent through time, the students were anachronistic reminders of the stories that took place under today's facades and are forgotten by many today. They became archiving connectors between then and now, peeling off the superimposed layers covering what was once the reality of the surviving witnesses. To prepare the students for Paris, in fall 2019, Megan Moody led both class sections in workshops in which they were introduced to the basics of 360 filming, covering technology, examples, equipment, and software. Students were also able to demo the 360 experiences Melanie shot in summer 2019 of Rochelle's story. Megan worked closely with staff members of the Vitali Digital Media Lab at Penn Libraries who served as consultants and provided all of the equipment for students. We decided to go with consumer grade Insta360 One X cameras, which are very lightweight and beginner friendly. In class, students also practiced getting out of shot and interviewing one another. Students visited their filming ro locations remotely with Google Earth to get a sense of the space. And we asked students to practice as much as they could with the cameras before leaving for Paris. We posed questions to them to get them thinking more critically about recording in 360. At what height should the tripod stand? Lower to mimic Mar Marcel Cohen's experience as a child or higher to indicate his reflections as an adult? Where would his gaze be in each instance, for example? Once in Paris, over the course of four days, students filmed and edited a raw version of their videos. Through the creation of the documentaries, students were in dialogue with Cohen's text, interpreting and capturing the space through his words. The use of 360 cameras enabled students to reconstruct these spaces, albeit transformed by time, more authentically for viewers, providing them with an impression of how these spaces impacted the author. This created a dynamic triad of author, students, and viewer in which all have agency. On the one hand, the author's narration accompanied the 360 video and determined filming locations. On the other, students interpreted his words through the filming and editing of 360 experiences, while the viewer in a VR headset chooses how to engage these experiences, unhindered by framing boundaries to a degree. At the end of each filming day, students edited their footage. They were asked to select clips to show the author later that week. The group that filmed the itinerary that Marcel Cohen took to visit his mother awaiting deportation in the Rothschild Hospital wanted to be creative. They originally shot a clip in which one of them posed as his mother. However, due to its potentially triggering nature, we asked them not to demo this clip. We were fortunate to be invited by Marcel Cohen in his home, where he shared family pictures and let us smell his father's cologne described in his book. The author also generously agreed to put on the Oculus headset and watch the first video filmed in the Parc Monceau, one of the places he seldom goes back to. After an initial reaction of wonder, the little boy turned old man was visibly moved. He removed the headsets and thanked us. He didn't want to see more. This moment was a reminder that the empathy triggered by VR comes with ethical responsibilities. As much as this virtual spatial translation can lead to a deeper understanding of the text by the reader, one must bear in mind it can also trigger anxiety in the subject author of the text. Following the encounter, the creative group agreed on, it, on their own it would not be right to keep their acting seen. This decision making was an example of how the students gained perspective and empathy and grew through the heuristic process. Students became active collaborators of the course, 
since the videos were eventually embedded on the digital map dedicated to the author's life during the war and will be used as course material in the future as an alternative reading method of Cohen's text. Vicky. Uh, the digital projects combining GIS and VR technologies. Oh, no. no, I'm reading these. Oh, can you read the quote? Oh, sure. <laughs> and it might not be, continued Austerlitz, that we also have appointments to keep in the past, in what has gone before and is for the most part extinguished, and must go there in search of places and people who have some connection with us on the far side of time, so to speak. So Vicky has a much uh, better English accent, so I have her read as much as I can. Um, so as a conclusion, uh, the digital projects combining GIS and VR technologies presented here open an interest into the fabric of time and space, which seem to answer Austerlitz's request. In fact, it enables the participants and anyone accessing their products to connect, to connect with a distant past and a faraway place. The projects became the shields the instructor and the students forged in order to approach a frightening part of history and draw personal lessons from it. The back and forth movement between past and present, historical narratives and individual testimonies, national and personal, reading and making, encouraged them to not only consider the time period, but also to be considerate towards those who lived it. It enabled them to feel empathy towards people in a time they could not hear at first. Their endeavors put on the map the, the unheard stories of invisible strangers, stitched together scattered narratives, and weaved an infinite constellation connecting that past present to our current present. They realized that six million victims of the Holocaust means one plus one plus one plus one, plus one individuals who had dreams loved, had their favorite dish, exactly like we do. They learned to take into consideration the humanity of others, to recognize themselves in others and others in themselves. A philanthropic knowledge they can further apply to other invisible, voiceless individuals from other places who live around us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have about three minutes for questions. So please, anyone who's got questions, uh, type it into the Q&A box um, and our guests will respond. Um, I so, always have questions, so if nothing shows up. So Pete, I just have to say something. Uh, yeah. I saw that uh, Claudia and Dana are actually uh, in here in the room. Uh, uh -huh. They are students who participate in the project. So if you have any questions, uh, that only students can answer, please feel free. Oh, that's great. Um, well, well, I actually have one <laughs> directed toward students. Uh, I, I thought your issue about um, the ethics involved with when you actually make things that uh, make th things tangible and real um, in this kind of uh, interactive experience can have challenges. And I, I wondered if there was a lot of debate amongst the students or within the class on those issues. Claudia, Dana, turn on your videos. Oh. Hi, I'm Claudia. So um, Dana and I were both part of um, the class that went to Paris in the end um, and did the project on the ground. And I think uh, that's actually a very good question. Um, I think definitely within our smaller groups, we had, we discussed like, um, the impact a certain scene might have on the survivor, um, especially once we actually did the whole thing and we were supposed to show it to them in the end. Um, definitely in private. I don't know if we talked about this with Melanie, but definitely in private when we we're editing the videos, um, we definitely discussed um, what we thought the impact would be. But um, I think, I don't know if other groups did that. Um, my group definitely did. Um, we just thought that even though the scene is definitely different, um, seeing it again, it's still the same space, um, especially in VR, it's a very different experience, um, as you guys well know. Um, and so with the technology and with the emotions connected to the space, we definitely discussed whether or not it would be a um, like a triggering moment for 
the survivors that we worked with. So I think, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, unfortunately we're at the end of time, but um, please continue the uh, conversation in the Q and A box. And there's a question from Paul Driver up there that uh, you guys can uh, perhaps answer um, uh, in, the, in that box. Um, we are gonna move on to our, thank you very much. Uh, we're gonna move on to our next presenters. Um, so if everyone can switch around their cameras, um, we now have uh, Enrico Gandalfi and Robert Clements, um, along with uh, Richard uh, Ferdig, who are going to talk about uh, social engagements in layers of history uh, and XR experience of the May 4th shootings. Thank you, Peter, and good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here, even if it's virtually. So today we are going to tell you a story and as you probably know, the best stories start with a problem or better, a question. And actually we have, I'm sorry, I don't know why it's not moving my presentation. Let me just, okay, perfect, I'm sorry. <laughs> so. We are actually, as I was telling you, we are actually trying to tell you a story today. And um, we actually have three very good questions that you can read in front of you right now. How can we make new generation engage with the past? How can we foster reflection and discussion about recent history and how we can reframe our here and now? Why are these questions so important for us? Well, we are researchers, developers, and scholars from Kent State University. 50 years ago, from 2000 to 3000 students and spectators gathered at Kent State for protesting the Vietnam War. The US National Guard opened fire and killed four students and wounded other nine. It was, it was one of the most uh, pivotal events in recent American history, with very concrete uh, implication in terms of civil rights, activism, and students' protests. And, this year, actually, we have the 50th anniversary. So, of course, right now, visitors, students can take tours, visit places of interest. Part of the Kent State campus is national landmark. However, uh, we noticed that some of them felt disconnected. And this was especially true for young generations and our freshmen. So this is why we realized, well, we have a problem. And we need to find an answer to those three question and we just saw. And this is actually how the May for uh, standard reality experience came to life. Uh, we were uh, blessed enough to have the support of the National Endowment for Humanities for two rounds of funding. With the first round, we were able to develop an augmented reality prototype and about May 4th. Um, we pick augmented reality for its ability to augment the past while empowering the present and also working on this synergy. And it's especially true considering that Kent State landscape has changed a lot in the last 50 years. With the second round of funding, uh, we were also able to expand the scope of our project. So we create a platform hosting augmented reality, but also virtual reality, extended reality experiences so that users, visitors from all around the world were actually able to access our content. Moreover, with the second round, we also start and also finalize uh, our augmented reality editor, Glare, uh, with which everybody can potentially create uh, his or her own augmented reality tour or path with few clicks. And this is, a, let's start actually with the May for uh, extended reality uh, experience. So it's a geolocated path that you can experience on campus or off campus, so in present or in remote. It's not actually an app, but it's a mobile friendly website and you can just click the link and you're really going to start the experience. It relies on seven hotspots that are of course in places of interest related to the uh, May 4th events. And for each hotspot, there is an overlay uh, content, which is an historical picture with uh, voiceover. And there are also four additional categories of content, what we call layers. The first layer is the context, what was happening in that location before May 4th. The second category is May 4th, uh, 1970. So 
uh, what happened that day in that location. The third category is um, commemoration. So the role of that location in terms of anniversaries, uh, memory healing, um, trying to remember what, what happened. And finally, um, the last layer is versus for changing, um, which actually is a set of questions and pros for triggering reflection, discussion about the themes around the thoughts of civil rights, activism, student process, and so on. So we have a, a very short video uh, for showing you how our platform work uh, uh, from remote. Welcome to the May 4th AR Experience, which is composed of a series of hotspots with content about the events at Kent State University. Tap Begin Tour to start. Turn the volume up on your device. Click on each hotspot on the map to access augmented reality images and information about the site. Each hotspot shows an historical image from May 1970 displayed on a 360 degree image from today. You can use your mouse to look around the picture. Use the various icons to access additional information or to return to the map. So this is the first hotspot. It gives you a good idea of how the app application works. On May 4th, 1970, Approximately 2,000 gathered here at the Victory Bell to protest the Vietnam War and the presence of the Ohio National Guard on campus. On May 1, 1970, a group of 500 students led by history graduate students gathered here at the Victory Bell to protest President Nixon's announcement of the Cambodian invasion the night before after bearing a copy of the United States Constitution as a symbol of an expansion of an already unpopular war, the organizers called for a larger protest at noon on Monday, May 4th, 1970. After a weekend of turmoil off campus and on, an estimated 2,000 people gathered that Monday to protest the Vietnam War in the presence of the Ohio National Guard on campus. Since 1971, friends, family, and students gather in silence at the Victory Bell at 11 p.m. on May 3rd for the start of the annual candlelight vigil in March. On May 4th, the bell is rung 15 times, one for each of the victims of the Kent State shooting and the two men killed at Jackson State. How is student activism different today? So this is really just one, one very quick example, but of course, more or less the other parts of the work working this way. So we were also able to test uh, our platform. We had one doctoral dissertation by Dr. Jim Raber and also two additional studies, uh, finding very interesting outcomes. For instance, we noticed a significant increase of situational interest and knowledge retention about May 4, especially among uh, our freshmen and young, young students. Moreover, um, the geolocation and the augmented reality ability to bring the past back to life was really appreciated, but also the, uh, the opportunity to try this platform in two different ways, augmented reality on campus and also from remote, so off campus. This was also actually very important because as I said, uh, this year is our 50th anniversary. And of course, a lot of events uh, planned were canceled, but our platform was actually there. And these are actually some, uh, some, this is some data about our uh, traffic and the um, platform and the extended reality platform was uh, released end of April, last April. And in just few days, we got almost uh, 1,500 unique uh, users. And what is also very interesting is that they were from all around the world, especially US, but also from other countries. And also they were young, you, you can see that the majority is younger than uh, 34 years old, which is actually, actually trying to answer those questions is actually a very interesting highlight. And after months, more or less the story that data tell us is more or less the same as you can see uh, in the right. 
And now we can uh, start to explain a little bit into a little bit more about the technical aspect of our platform. Thank you very much, Enrico. Um, I'm Rob Clements here, and I'll kind of give an overview of the AR platform and uh, from the outset of this project, how we kind of designed it so it was expandable, right? From the from the start of the uh, this particular project, we wanted an experience that was web-based. We didn't want to rely on any application stores just because the ags natural layer development, um, as well as scrutiny as well. And we wanted to be able to make these changes rapidly. So we wanted a website that was basically didn't really care about what data was being presented um, to the user. I'm still using your presentation, Enrico. Um, so we wanted to generate um, uh, basically a, a platform that can be used for other things, that can be used for additional humanities, as well as these other types of experiences. But using the same framework where we could have images that are overlaid um, on 360, uh, images as well as in, in uh, live view, as well as linked to this map system. We also wanted this to be end user friendly. We wanted people who were going to try and you know uh, use this platform to not have to worry about any coding and have uh, and allow them to basically concentrate on content creation. Uh, next slide. So as far as um, what we actually created was Glare, right? This geolocated augmented reality air, um, editor. And what this basically does is when we first generated this prototype, we basically had a configuration system where we had to manually generate this text string with you know, uh, all of these uh, delimited things. And, and it was a nightmare to keep track of, right? It's still, it's a JSON object, but it's, it's difficult for any end user. Uh, the first studies we did, we had people try and generate these toys using this system and it was problematic. So from there, we, what we wanted to do is uh, create an online system where people just connect to a website, put in all the relevant information, and then it will basically spit out a tour uh, using this, this framework system that we have. Uh, this, this framework basically uh, is an interpreter. If you go back to the previous slide for one more, um, that's again. So we basically, for this uh, website, uh, we uh, basically have a, a configuration system and an interpreter for it. Next slide. As far as uh, the web server, basically uh, just host the information and the data. All of the heavy lifting is done by the web server or the web browser of the, the user. This browser can be on a cell phone device, a, uh, a connected laptop, desktop, any device that has a, a relatively new web browser. Um, we wanted this to be cross-platform as well, uh, which is a tricky thing to design these kind of experiences for different size uh, phones and different types of screens. Anyway, this is kind of the general architecture where we have this data that's taken by this uh, by the web server. Uh, and then the user can either view the tour from this map view or the actual first person view, essentially. And then the tour is actually presented to the user using augmented reality, where the image is overlaid on live video, or they are taken to the virtual reality, um, the virtual reality uh, version of the website. Um, so on the next slide, you will um, actually kind of see how we have generated these tour descriptions. From the outset, we want this uh, platform to not just work for the May 4th uh, event, but also to be modular and be able to expandable other people to add to it. So this kind of tour description where we have these levels of information where basically you have the entire tour is described by um, N number of sites that have these specific, uh, specific GPS coordinates. And then from there, each of these tours can have library content as well as different menu systems. Um, and these systems are intelligent where if information has not been populated by the person who's created this tour, then that specific menu item is removed uh, to allow an, an element of customizability um, to this project. So on the next slide, you can actually see uh, basically just an, a screenshot of, of a number of the different web pages. But the idea is that uh, a user will connect to the Glare website, uh, enter all the name of the project. They can either edit an existing project or create a new project and basically navigate this map, right? And it allows the simple development of these new experiences where you just navigate to a position on earth, input the information, the text that you would like at that particular location, what augmented reality image, any virtual reality image, um, as well as audio that would be played when, when users enter these specific hotspots. We also have a, a way to do this rapidly. You can kind of connect to this expert configuration page. But what happens is when you've completed creating this tour, uh, basically this, the, the website will uh, allow you to download the configuration for your system. And then with all the media that you have in your configuration file, you can download the interpreter, which, will, which can then be placed in any um, simple uh, web server and it will um, serve the, the website. 
Um, so that's the, the, the Glare editor, which basically allows you to use the platform without having any knowledge of it, but generate these new experiences that have these rich media content. Uh, the next slide, um, I just want to show a few examples now of, of how uh, we've had students. Uh, the first one is uh, a student created a couple of hotspots at a local farmer's market uh, with things about the stalls and, and talked about eating healthy, uh, providing some other tours. The next slide, you can see uh, another student. Uh, and we try and basically when we allow people to create these tours, we just say, you know, do it, use the system, see what you can create. And it's interesting to see how far people go. Maybe they'll go to two, three different menu systems, or maybe they'll just stay at one menu system and have a number of different uh, hotspots. But here is a Welcome to Kent State tour, which another student created. I'm just showing a few screenshots of the map itself, as well as some of the overlaid imagery uh, of these particular hotspots. But this is just to welcome new students to Kent State, orient them, uh, and basically they walk around campus and can have these things prompted to them. Um, as well to help them feel connected to Kent State as well. Uh, the, uh, I guess the probably the largest example we have in the next slide was uh, a project uh, that we wanted to basically evaluate how Glare is useful for creating these new projects. Uh, so in the next slide, you can see the uh, Wick Poetry Center uh, tour. Uh, we partnered with the Wick Poetry Center at Kent State. It was uh, uh, their well-renowned uh, you know, poetry center that um, ha engages in the number of different multimedia activities to engage people in poetry for good, essentially. Uh, but this tour was based around um, using uh, their uh, poetry as well as images uh, and their um, staff to actually create this tour that consists of five different hotspots around Kent. Uh, and you basically go to these hotspots with your cell phone, you see overlaid images, you see poetry uh, in text form, the poetry is read to you either potentially by the person who actually created the, the poem themselves, uh, a classroom of students. And the whole idea behind this tour is to kind of promote inclusivity uh, within Kent itself and um, allow people to feel more connected to the city itself. You move to the next slide, Enrico. Uh, we can see uh, that this is actually beneficial. So we, we start this study maybe a month or two ago, obviously it's difficult, but we've been pushing uh, participants through and we've kind of have this longitudinal study investigating community poetry and, and how extended reality can uh, afford a connection with people uh, to uh, these community poems. So in this uh, first study, we see a significant increase in the sense of belonging and connectedness. Uh, and Blair itself supported rapid content creation where people could just, uh, you know, the, the people creating could think about what imagery and what poems should be associated with these particular, uh, you know, uh, physical locations on campus. So if anyone would like to get involved in this particular project, um, I think uh, the next slide you can see uh, people, uh, well, here are some of the future editions. I'm not gonna go into these, but we're all, uh, these, we've done these for other um, projects and are ongoing and, and using these four projects and adding models and other market-based uh, projections uh, to the system. We're also beginning to host tours as well. And on the final slide here, uh, this is just, if anyone has any interest, please go to the website you can experience the May 4th tour itself, the May 4th XL website. Um, Glare itself will be released on GitHub uh, in the coming months. Uh, that being said, um, the editor is actually live. So you can, if you go to the May 4th website here, uh, the, the, uh, the link will post in the chat, uh, but you can actually uh, connect to the editor and generate your own tour that you could use. Uh, and we're actively beginning to host these tours um, on the, the May 4th website. And that's kind of one area that we want to expand where we just allow people not only to create these using this editor, but also uh, we would host them. So I'd like to say thank you very much. And uh, any questions, please. Great, thank you. Yeah, we have some. We have a little time for questions. We'll, we'll run a minute or two over to accommodate any questions. So please type a question into the Q&A section. Uh, looks like Paul Driver's got a question for you, um, Enrico. This is a very good question. It's, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned in one of your slides an increase of situational interest and knowledge retention. Have you any insight of leveraging spatial memory as a mnemonic? How did you go to increase in both aspects? That's, this is a, an amazing question. Actually, we didn't really focus on spatial memory, not yet, but it's actually a very interesting insight for future studies. And um, for the increase, we have used scales uh, instruments that have been validated um, just as a way to, so we did really pre and post, um, but we, we have used, and there are good, already good instruments covering those aspects. So this is how we did it. Great. 
Any other uh, questions from the attendees or other, I guess, yeah, here we go. There's one from Chris, Chris, Christina Textor. Do you have an answer for that one, Enrico? I'm not sure. I don't know. <laughs> Anyone else? There's another one there. Yeah, so so one of the things I will say, I mean, it's a great question. And I think yeah. um, to, to answer that question, you have to understand the context of uh, the May 4th shootings and the fact that um, how it was handled by the university and by the community when it first happened compared to over the course of the last 50 years. And so uh, I, I think there's probably a longer conversation behind that question, uh, but suffice it to say that the naming and the, the, the nomenclature about the event, uh, what you call it and how you refer to it is, um, uh, was not really left up to us. I think, <laughs> I think there's probably the best way to say that, uh, that there's uh, com uh, committees and so forth that uh, on the campus that uh, are above our pay grade that, uh, that told us how and it could be named and so forth. So it's a, it's a great question. That's probably a, a two or three hour conversation uh, with people above our pay grade. Great. And there's another one from Mitchell R. How easy it is to, how easy it is it to deploy projects created from your platform to many locations? Um, I Not entirely what you so I guess you can deploy them from any desktop to any location, I guess the idea is if, I, if I'm understanding the question correctly, uh, basically um, the as long as you have the GPS coordinates and input them into uh, the glare um, editor, then they will basically show up wherever those coordinates are, as long as the user has uh, GPS activated on the phone, if they do not, or their device. If they don't, then they will be using uh, a desktop to access the source and they will be funneled to a different version of the experience. Excellent. Well, I, I would like to thank you guys and all of our presenters for really, really engaging in, in interesting uh, topics and presentations. And um, now Susan is going to uh, post links to our hub rooms where we can further our interactions. So if you guys go to the chat, um, you can hit those links and pick a hub room to try out and meet there. And, we'll and can I ask if there's an attendee still listening, if you can type in the question box, let me know if you received that um, chat, uh, the links in the chat. Um, apparently in the last session, someone let me know that they couldn't see the links. So I just wanted to make sure. Okay, cool. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. Just checking on that. Okay, so we welcome you guys into, there are three rooms. Um, so you guys can uh, move between the different rooms if you'd like. And for our presenters, thank you so much. That was an amazing uh, group of projects and um, really appreciate your time. And, and Peter, thank you for uh, moderating for us too. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Yay to our uh, presenters. Uh, we'll see everybody in the hub rooms. <laughs>